really believe God began to prepare LifeBridge for where we are today and where we're going for some time now. And uh, I'm very, very grateful this morning to have Natalie working with us in the service this morning. Uh, and uh, she was here yesterday and did teaching with our next gen workers and grateful to Pastor Joe and Becca and their whole team who put the day together and just have heard wonderful things and so grateful for Natalie uh, training leadership for us here at LifeBridge as we, as we move into what all God's got in store for us today. But she's also been a dear friend to Grace and I for a long time and uh, when we begin to know that it was time and God wanted to bring in leadership for us for the next generation, we just uh, really prayed about it. And then I called Natalie one day and I said, I need to find your clone that would be willing to live in Fort Wayne. Well, I don't think Joe's exactly a clone, but <laughs> Becca may be. Anyway, I do thank God for what he's done and what he's doing and, and because you've been such a wonderful blessing to us through the process of helping us both process what we need, helping us in the search, and then helping us to hold steady and not get ahead of God, settling for less than what he had, and then the whole vetting process that you've been involved, and now the ongoing process of helping us to continue to strategically move into everything we're supposed to do. Natalie, for many years, was the next gen pastor down the road from us in Newcastle, and uh, then God has moved her and her family to uh, California, and she is now the next gen director for the Western District of Foursquare. She also is a director of the Children's Box for uh, Foursquare Missions Press. And she's also on the board of trustees for Life Pacific University. And I don't know if there's any other official positions, but I know those are all strategic positions for what God's doing. And it's just such an honor to have you here with us today. Would you welcome Natalie as she comes to share God's word with us this morning? Thank you. Bless you. Wow, you guys are blessed with Pastor Bill and Grace. You guys know that, right? I don't have to tell you how blessed you are. Um, you know, the process of Joe and Becca coming here um, was a long one. We've been in discussions for a long time. And I love, I love a pastor, a pastoral couple who um, is full of the Holy Spirit, but also knows how to wait. Right, sometimes we're like super Pentecostal and we get a little ahead of ourselves, I think, at times. But they were patient and waited for the direction of the Lord and really, um, you know, Pastor Joe and Becca being here, I think is, is a part of the favor and blessing of their diligence to serve you and your families well. That's been their heart, that's been my experience. I tell people all the time, this is one of my favorite churches in all of Foursquare. All right, but don't tell the Western District because I have 400 churches out there who think they're my favorite. So if we could just keep that between us and scratch that from the record, we won't tell anyone. Um, but I think I know a lot of you, so I'm not gonna do a huge intro because I've been here. Um, this feels a bit like a second or third home to me in Indiana. And I just love this church. I love um, just your heart for the next generation, your heart for mission. Missions. I live, eat, and breathe missions as well as young people. Well, I don't actually live, eat, and breathe young people, but I really enjoy both, and I really enjoy the roles that I get to do um, that kind of bring all of those together. So I serve in the Western District. That basically means I kind of oversee a whole bunch of churches that uh, have next-gen ministry. So when we say next-gen, we mean uh, college through cradle or kids, youth, and young adults, and I get to be a part of that. Um, but with like the children's gospel box, I basically train leaders to do next-gen ministry around the world, and we resource them for free. Um, we are working on a project even now. Um, the, the country of Malawi is asking to give every student in the public schools of Malawi, which is near South Africa, a Bible. And so we get to serve them in a really cool way and give Bibles to kids, public school children in Malawi. Things like that, um, I just get really excited about what God is doing and what God is doing at Asbury. Isn't it interesting that God would choose private Christian colleges to pour out his spirit? Isn't that interesting? Why not somewhere else? Like it's not a church. There's a bunch of believers gathered. It could have been a church, could have been a stadium gathering. I just think it's really fascinating that God has, has kind of done something extraordinary on college campuses to think about that. 
Um, so anyway, I'm gonna skip a lot of introduction, but I did bring a picture of my family. Um, just so you know, I'm a real person. Uh, this is my husband and my daughter. We've, my husband and I have been married for about 16 years. I have a nine-year-old. Um, we've also been foster parents. I don't know if I have any foster adoptive parents in here, but that is so near and dear to our heart. We fostered about 12 different kiddos. Um, so we've had a wide range of ages in our home. So I feel like I've parented like an entire uh, generation all at once almost, and have really enjoyed, again, to know a lot of kids and being a part of their lives. Um, and I've been doing ministry with young people full-time now for 15 years. And I'm living in California now where typically when I talk about California, I get to talk about how great the weather is compared to here. But right now the weather's horrible there. So I'll just skip that part. Um, but I'm really excited to be here. Got to spend yesterday with a whole bunch of children's ministry uh, leaders. You guys, they were here for 10 hours. Like if you were in the room, just raise your hand so we can recognize all of you that listened all day yesterday. Yes, these are the rock stars, the champions who have a heart for kids or at least are beginning to catch a vision for kids ministry. And uh, we just had a great time. You guys are so blessed with, uh, with great leaders, with Joe and Becca being here and um, just a great team of kids ministry volunteers telling you um, you're in for a treat. God is on the move here, I believe, in big ways, um, connecting this church body with young people. And so when I had an initial conversation with Pastor Bill about, hey, what do you, you know, what's Sunday morning? What's it looking like? He said, well, we're having this series going the distance, but you don't have to stick with that. Um, in church language, we call it a standalone. That's what we say. Like it's a standalone service, meaning it doesn't necessarily fit in. And I said, yeah, I'll probably just do something like next gen, um, just, you know, standalone. And then something stirred in me that like, wait a minute, going the distance isn't separate from next gen. Right, so I sort of leaned into this going the distance and started to think about who in scripture went where it was going the distance. People that we see lived out this mission of going the distance and it just kept stirring in my heart. So I kind of threw out the idea of doing a next gen standalone and leaned into this. And maybe this was just the leading of the Holy Spirit. I also think I'm at a, I'm at a crossroads of a birthday this year that will begin a new decade. We won't say which one. Okay, we won't say, <laughs> but I'm beginning to think, what does the next decade of my life look like? And so this idea of going the distance was like, well, yeah, I'm heading into a new decade and kind of assessing what will the next decade of my life be? Because boy, the last decade feels like a blur. Anybody else feel like that? Like where, wait, wasn't I just 20? Like, wasn't I just 30? I won't go, I'm not gonna say any more numbers because then you're gonna know <laughs> where I'm headed. Um, but uh, I just began to think like I've really been assessing life and lifespan and going the distance. Um, I also think it's because of some conversations I've been having with my grandmother. Um, I brought a picture of my grandma actually with me. Uh, my grandma had a stroke in, uh, in 2001 we're very close knit family, like really, really close. But we realized um, we couldn't take care of her medical needs with her at home. And so she's been in a nursing home. My grandma before this was like uh, so full of God's word that it just oozed out of her. Um, does anyone, you know, there's a verse in scripture that says, let every conversation be seasoned with salt. That's not my grandma. She like takes the salt shaker lid off and like pours it on. Every conversation is not seasoned with salt, it is salty. And so you go visit her and uh, even she writes some things and it's all just full of the word and full of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and then she has a stroke and we're like, wait a second. Like, what are you doing here, Lord? Like she has gone the distance. She has been all in with Jesus for her whole life, has served in like different, just volunteer ministry positions in church. And now she can't walk anymore and ends up in a nursing home. And what I've seen is that she has continued to go the distance. So my grandma went from staying home, studying scripture, sharing with people who came to visit, a bit like a shut-in, to now she's in a nursing home. And you guys, she's like teaching Bible studies. Uh, the preacher who used to do the Sunday morning service stopped coming and so she took over like their like service or whatever. Uh, and she's asked me to guest speak a few times. That's been, <laughs> I've been the guest speaker at the nursing home Bible study. It's been so much fun. Um, but here's the thing, several times a day, young people, nurses, nurses aides have to come into her room 
and every conversation is salty. <laughs> and I don't mean salty like young people use salty, like we're mad or we're angry, uh, but salty as in seasoned with salt. And she's speaking the words. She's leading people to the Lord. Um, she says, you know, she ha people have to like sit in the bathroom with her. And she's like, they have to sit there. They're just a captive audience. Like, so I don't fall. And so she's just led them to the Lord. People have been filled with the spirit right in her little room at her nursing home. I mean, she's like rubbing off on all these other people. And I think that's what's going the distance. Isn't that something that we as believers would want to say is true of our life? To have a legacy that not only has impacted in our younger years, but even even as we continue to grow closer to the Lord and closer to heaven, that we're still having an impact, that we're still going the distance. Isn't that something that you would want for, for you and for your community as well, not just where she lives, but for here, that you would be able to go the distance. I think it has cost her a lot, time, money, comfort. Maybe she doesn't actually even wanna be there, but Paul didn't wanna be in prison probably right? And he wrote most of the New Testament. There's a lot of things that we see in scripture. People didn't really want to be in jail. Uh, Joseph didn't really want to be in jail or certain people didn't really want to be where they were, but they continued to go the distance despite what was going on in their life. So I begin to think about, we see this in scripture a lot and the Lord really highlighted David to me, King David. And in scripture, he's called a man after God's own heart. So let me read to you from 1 Samuel 13 when we first hear this. Remember that the background is that Saul was the king and Samuel is the prophet and Saul's the king and he's reigning and God says, uh, not so fast. We're, we're gonna be done with you here. Here's what it says. And 1 Samuel uh, 13, if you have your Bibles or it's up on the screen. Samuel said to Saul, you've done foolishly. You've not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded of you. For now, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And who do we know that man to be? David, right. And so then David is anointed king a little while later. David fights a giant. Does anyone know the name? I'm used to working with kids, so you're gonna have to be a little more interactive, all right? Can someone like stand up and run around the room? That'd be really help me, all right? So feel free to do whatever you need. Uh, David fights a giant named Goliath. Listen, you guys should go serve in kids ministry. Just go over there. It's a lot of fun <laughs> and they're doing some real discipleship and kids are learning um, all of these things. But so David and Goliath, and then uh, he gets called, David gets called in to play music for King Saul um, when Saul is struggling in a moment and that doesn't go so well actually. And then around age 30, David becomes king and then he starts to make plans to build a temple. The Lord says, you know, I've lived everywhere. Like my people haven't really settled. And so we, he starts to like lead David to, to building a temple, gives him this promise of a temple to be built. And then David makes some mistakes. Anyone know the name of some of David's mistakes? <laughs> I wanna say those, <laughs> Bathsheba, uh, Uriah, like he, he begins to make some mistakes. If this story is new to you, I want you to jot down uh, 2 Samuel 11 and 12. Because for those of us that think, wow, I have such a history, I might not be able to serve or I might not be able to impact anybody else, you should read David's history. Here's, might match it, but I'm guessing we don't have murderers in the room. So maybe, maybe that's your, maybe you've been delivered and we're so glad you're here if that's you. Uh, but David has quite the history um, that would probably make yours look not quite so bad. And so I would encourage you to, to take a moment to read it. I'm not gonna go into all the details, but I wanna encourage you to check it out. Check out his story in 2 Samuel. 11. Um, I also know that Espy, Pastor Espy was here, a good friend of mine, just a few weeks ago. And I did listen to a bit of her sermon where she kind of spoke a word that God is doing a new thing and encouraged you to not stay stuck in the old thing, right? That we're not a victim to what's happened in our past. We deal with it, we, we work through it, and we allow God to, to take us forward through it. But that's part of going the distance, is that we don't stay stuck. And I think that's a key to David's life and why we see him going the distance. I think he had a repentant heart. Let's look at Psalm 51 really quickly here. This is after his mistake um, with the affair and the murder that he was a part of. Psalm 51 verse one says, have mercy on me, O God. This is David writing. 
according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And he is repentant. I think this is part of going the distance is that we accept what has happened in our life with a, and we have a repentant heart, right? We come before the Lord and we're repentant about what has happened. But we don't see David stuck there. That's not where it ends. His story doesn't end there and go, I made a mistake, I've repented and now I'm just gonna cruise, right? Or something, something bad has happened in my life and I'm now dealing with it and so I'm just gonna cruise. We don't see that in David at all. He didn't, say, didn't stay stuck. He repented and then continued to move forward. I think this is part of the going the distance that we need to take a look at. That he continued to move forward. That God caused him to look towards the future and what God had promised him. It's interesting. So, God kind of promises David there's going to be a house, build a temple. I think David was probably excited about this. And then we get to this part where God says, it's not going to be you. Interesting. Let's look at that. This is in 1 Chronicles chapter 22. This is David explaining to his son Solomon says, David said to Solomon, my son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house to the name of the Lord, my God. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed much blood and have made great wars. You shall not build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. Behold, a son will be born to you who will be a man of rest. And I will give him rest from all of his enemies around. His name will be Solomon and I will give him peace and quietness to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name and he shall be my son and I will be his father and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel together. Now it's interesting, right, that, that David had a vision in his heart of God building, of building a, a temple for the people, for community. I think David's heart was focused on the community. What does Israel need? We need a gathering place. We need a temple. We need a place that's of significance. And God says, it's not going to be you. And I often wonder how I would take that news. <laughs> right? Let's do something. This is going to be great. And God says, no, it's going to be your son. David had one of two options here, I think, to go, fine. (laughs) I'll just stand back and watch. Good luck with that. Or, okay, let's roll up my sleeves. I'm going to help my son. Which one do we see David doing? You probably know the story. We can read it here. Same chapter. First Chronicles 22, five says, now David said, Solomon, my son is young and inexperienced and the house to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent, famous and glorious throughout all the countries. You can hear his vision, right? His vision is like tracking. He's like so excited. And so here's what he says. So I'm not gonna have any part of it. Is that what it says? That's not what he says. He says, I will now make preparation for it. So David made abundant, some translations say exceeding preparations before his death. You see, I think the key to David going the distance was that he understood the impact of his life on the community and on the next generation. So you thought I wasn't going to do next generation, but I just can't help it. It's right here. It's right there in scripture that David says, all right, it's not my turn to build the temple. I get it. I have too much history and God has given that task to my son. And so instead of standing back and saying, you know what? Fine, do it. I'm going to be bitter about it. Or you know what? Then if it's not mine, I don't want anything to do with it. He jumps in. He rolls up his sleeve and makes extensive, abundant preparations for his son. I think that's what allowed him to go the distance, that he was able to see the promise of God come true 
through his son, that he didn't sit back and do nothing because he didn't, he didn't get to do it during his lifetime, right? He didn't say, I'm too old, I have a history, all of that. He said, okay, so I'm gonna jump in because I see the need in our community and I see the opportunity to equip the next generation. Are you tracking with me here? He saw that, that, that the key to going the distance for us is that we understand community, that we're not in this for ourselves, we're not in it for um, what we can do, but that we're in it for our community and for the next generation that's coming after us. He was future-minded for the benefit of his son and his community. See, I think sometimes, you know, in America, I travel a lot around the world, and one of the things we're known for, well, one is that we smell like old cheese. Do you know that? Do you know that? That's just a side fact, it's a funny. Yeah, we drink, we eat so much dairy that uh, people in other countries think we smell like dairy. It's really funny. Uh, but anyways, the other thing we're known for is being very individualistic, right? And we like take pride in this rugged individualism. I can do it, I pull myself up by the bootstrap. That's not how the rest of the world is. And I'm not sure that's how most of scripture works. Most of scripture is community that we're, we're put in community, that things, life change happens in community, and then we try to like stand back. But I think David understood community, that the community needed this house of worship, and that he was all in to help the next generation bring it about. The Old Testament is full of stories where this did not happen. Like, r- just read it, you can test me on this full of stories where, where one generation did not pass down their faith and the next generation knew nothing of, of the Jehovah God. Judges 2.10 says another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. You see, we have a generation that's in danger of that. And yes, maybe we've always had generations that were in danger of that, but I really believe this generation, especially our kids under the age of 10, this gen, generation alpha they're called, that they're a generation whose numbers of biblical worldview and understanding of scripture and biblical literacy are the lowest we've ever seen. Could we just rise up in community and say, that's not gonna happen on my watch? that this could not be true of us, that what is said of the people in in Judges 2, that that a generation came up who didn't know the Lord and didn't know the things he'd done for Israel, not on my watch, that's not going to happen. You see, I don't think going the distance, getting to heaven is the success point if we're doing it alone. Like, good job, when you get there, you receive a crown, that's amazing. But listen, people are who we get, what we get to take to heaven. That's it, nothing else. And so if we go the distance and we end up alone with a generation who doesn't know God, then I have to ask, is that success? Is it really as personal as that? Yes, we have a personal Lord and Savior and it is our personal decision to follow and walk with him in a daily personal life. But what we see in scripture is this idea of community and and an impact on the next generation. It's like everywhere. When you read scripture, you have to think like there is something about this idea of community of God's people and what impact that the people of God can have on the next generation. See, I think our challenge is that as we go the distance, that we want to go the distance together for the sake of the world. Are you with me? Go together, that we go the distance together. That your your journeys are so intertwined that we're encouraging one another, that we're spurring one another onto good works so that the next generation can follow us. See, I think there's a danger when we disconnect from, from the community and a danger when we disconnect from the next generation. See, it'd be really easy for some of us to take that first option that David could have taken. That when God said, you know, you're not going to, you're not gonna build the temple where you can stand back. Or you say like, well, there's so much focus on the young people. So I'll just stand back. Or yeah, I, I don't know how to relate to them. So I'll just stand back. 
or I don't know what to say, or I don't know where to start, so I'll just stand back. And can I ask you, LifeBridge, please don't. Please don't. Going the distance will require community connected to the next generation. Really and truly, I think this is part of the heart of God. We see the first commandment is to be fruitful and multiply. And you can take that as have lots of kids, and I think that's part of it, but also that we multiply ourselves in our community, in our church, right? That if you're walking with the Lord, you're bringing someone else with you, right? Like if you're on a path to go the distance, you're not alone, there's someone with you. And can I tell you, you have kids and kids ministry, you have youth and youth ministry who are literally begging for that in their lives. They are begging for it. I can't understand why you'd wanna be in this room and not in that room. Can I just be honest with you? (laughs) There's good discipleship happening in there. I'm so glad you're here. Please come to church. I didn't say you shouldn't come to church and hear Pastor Bill. But we had some discussions yesterday with the children's ministry workers of what we can do in an hour in a child's life and the impact that can have for their discipleship and the greatness of that task. I wish it were such a thing that we like had so many people who wanted to serve in kids ministry that were like, sorry, not this week. You're gonna have to go to main session or the, the, the adult service, right? Wouldn't that be, that's like a dream. But I think if we truly understood going the distance, we'd put our feet in there. And this is not volunteer recruitment. Joe is not like paying me on the side to recruit volunteers. He didn't even mention that at all. I'm just saying when I read this, when I look at David's life, I see that he thought, okay, Solomon has a big task ahead of him. So I'm all in. I'm gonna roll up my sleeves and get involved. He didn't take the position of like really passive. I'll just stand back and watch. I'll just stand back and let him do it right? Because I'm the old guy or I'm not qualified or, or whatever. God said it wasn't me. Instead, he said, I'm going to make extensive preparations. And so what are we doing to make the extensive preparation to help the kids and the youth and our community to walk out the plans of God in their life? I want to show a video Um, Maybe you've seen it before. This is a video of a safari in uh, Kruger National Park, which is in South Africa. I'm a big safari fan, uh, going on safari. We get to do that. You know, we work like super hard in a mission strip and then we maybe get to go on safari. So maybe you've seen it before and maybe you know the ending, just stay with me. Um, It basically preaches itself. So if you've seen it before, hang with me and watch it with a different lens. I want you to watch this thinking about community and thinking about young people. Okay, so this is God's creation, the animal kingdom. I want, to, I want you to watch it thinking about community and young people. For kids in the room, it's a bit graphic, but it gets, the, it, the ending's good, just so you know. <laughs> I'm just giving a, a fair warning. So we're gonna think about community. How do we see the community engaging with the young wildebeest? Let's watch it. She have lions, chasing a baby wolves. She got him. Oh, she did. She got him. Maybe these these gonies just plucked a buffalo here. You have lions with the wildebeest. Now watch, a crocodile (laughs) on the other side. Check through the bonnet, the cock's trying to grab the baby. Look at this. The crocodile's taking the baby away. So the crocodile's pulling, pulling, pulling. The lions are pulling. Finally gives up. The lions have won. Oh, the lions have won. Yeah, but look at all those buffalo coming. Oh, they're going to come and try and chase the lion, but I think they're too late. I think they're right. And here comes the community. Right now. No, they're going to chase them. What do we do? No, they're too late. Do we stand yeah, back? Oh, look at the teeth. And that one's... Look at him. Ooh. Take up this Ooh. fight. Chase him. Come on. I've never seen that. I've never seen any like that. The calf's still alive. It is? Yeah, it's trying it's to get away. still alive. It's standing up. It is. It's a stunning. 
Oh, he's bailing out. He's running away. Oh, he's, he's, he's gone. They've got it back. They've got him back. They do have him back. Oh, it is. It is. They've got him back. It preaches itself, right? I think the picture of lions and crocodile coming after a young calf, well, it makes me emotional and I'm not a very emotional person, typically, <laughs> because I think that's a great picture of young people today. Um, if there are teenagers, kids in the room, I just want you to know we see you. We know it's hard. It's like exceptionally hard. There are more things pulling at kids than ever before from every side, right? It's not just the lions, it's also the crocodiles. They are in a battle. It is really hard to be a Christian in a middle school today. It is really hard to stand up and say, I believe 100% of the Bible. That's hard to do. That wasn't hard for me in middle school. I would suffice it to say for most of you, it wasn't hard for you in middle school either. It's really hard to say that, to say, I believe the truth of the word and I'm gonna live it out. Our kids are under attack just like that. It's not all that different. Isn't it interesting that the community leaves almost as if like, well, they got the kid. What made them turn around and come back and say, I'm gonna fight? They said, this battle is ours. It's not that little calf. The little calf was doomed from the beginning. But the community turns around and says, no, we are going to put our feet next to that, our horns into those lions to say, get away from this baby calf. And church, shouldn't this be a model for us? I think that's what David did, right? David goes, well, this good thing, I'm just gonna leave him alone to let Solomon do his thing. And David said, no, I'm going to put my feet there. I'm going to physically gather the stuff that is needed in order to carry out the plan of God in Solomon's life. Could we be those people who would say, we are going to put our feet there. We are going to be the people. We're gonna be the community that rallies around and says, we're gonna go the distance for the next generation and with the next generation. Could that be us? Friends, we, we have to because the next generation is under attack. And like I said in the beginning, it's so fascinating, praise God, the, the pour out of his spirit is coming on Christian college campuses. We are the people called to go the distance with the next generation, that we would rise up and take them with us it's tempting to say, wow, we never had to deal with that when I was a kid, period. But shouldn't we be the people who go, we've never had to, I never had to deal with that when I was a kid, but I'm gonna roll up my sleeves and I'm gonna get involved. Now I could be really prescriptive about what this looks like and say, here's what you should do. I'm gonna give you a couple ideas and then we're gonna end today by asking the Lord to speak to each of us. Because I don't think this is a message we get to just leave and go, yeah, somebody will do it. Or that good thing that she's training the kids workers. I think there's a part, we're a community that has to band together. One little wildebeest didn't go back and save the person, right? This isn't on the little team of children's ministry volunteers. This is all of us coming together and saying, we're gonna do this. We're gonna do this together. God has promised Pastor Bill and Pastor Grace some things about this next generation and we're gonna band together to see it come to fruition for the next generation. But you could get started in a couple different ways. This is a praying church, am I right? I mean, what I know of you guys is a praying church. So what if we went to Pastor Joe, we said, I want the name of every youth student we have at this church and we prayed for them. Daily, we put them on a schedule. On Mondays, I pray for these kids. On Tuesdays, I pray for these kids. What if that, if we shifted our prayers and said, that's how I can fight. I can put my little prayer, little horn into the enemy and pray. I can fight that battle in prayer. What if we sponsored every kid to get to summer camp? Now I have a vested interest in this because I love camp and I believe that God changes lives when kids are away and, and focused on him. But camp costs a lot this year. Also, I'm not getting paid to say this, but um, just so you know, the, the price of inflation has really affected camps around the nation and it's gonna cost families a lot. 
And there are families in this church who may already have checked out and go, whoo, $250, don't have that for my three kids. But maybe some of the rest of us do. And we could, as a community, say we're gonna get every kid to camp because we believe what God's gonna do in their heart. This could also look like helping out a mom and dad. We have moms and dads in the rooms who are in the trenches of raising kids in a time when every kid has a computer in their pocket. Can you imagine what life is like? Some of you can, your grandparents are, you're involved in young people's lives. It's something, it's something when my daughter can get every answer she needs from Siri. It's a different time to parent. (laughs) But maybe you could drop off a meal So yeah, I know how hard it is to get your kids around the table and get dinner and work and get dinner and all of that on top of a busy schedule. Could I just drop off dinner on Thursday? That's us coming around saying, we see you, we support you. We want to help the next generation to go the distance. There's gonna be just the keyboard playing here in a minute. And I wanna kind of call us to rally. The people of God are a people who rally that we bring the names of people just like we did in worship before the Lord. We rally behind them and we contend for their healing. We are a people of God that can rally, not a people of God uh, who do what we've always done or a people of God who, who look to their own interests. See, we have the opportunity to go the distance together in community for the sake of the next generation and alongside the next generation. So we're gonna close with just a reflection time. Like I said, I could be really prescriptive and like get you a five point outline, here's what you need to do. But I believe the Holy Spirit is in each of us and will lead you to something even more creative, even more connected, even better than I could even prescribe. And so I wanna end today in just a reflection time where you would ask the Lord, what's my part in this? that what's my part to go the distance with the community? Maybe that means you need need to be in like a small group or you need to grab an accountability partner, that that we're connected to the community and that we're alongside the next generation. That what's happening in us and through us, we understand that the kids and the youth who will be here tonight are part of it so that we can see the next generation follow Jesus, so that we can see the next generation change the world and finish this great commission task that we have. Amen. Let's take just a few minutes, two minutes, I'm gonna be quiet. I understand that's like kind of awkward because we're, we like noise. (laughs) We're gonna take two minutes just to reflect. Say, God, what's my part in this? And before we do that, if you're here today and you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus, I wanna invite you to do that. I wanna say welcome to the community. Scripture says that we make a decision to follow Jesus. We, We confess with our mouth that he's our Lord and we believe in our heart and then we're saved. And then you get to be a part of this community that like the band of wildebeest comes around and says, we're gonna fight for you, we believe in you, we want to see you walk with Jesus. If that's you today during this time of reflection, all you have to say is, God, I believe in who you are. Confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. We have a repentant heart, and then we get to be a part of this community to go the distance together. So let's spend just a few minutes in reflection. Thank you, Lord. God, would you speak to us in this time? We thank you for your word that helps to show us who you are and what your will is in our lives. Lord, speak to us in this moment about what our part is. God, what are you calling us to? What's the next step we can take with you to go the distance together with this community alongside the next generation? Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us, we pray.
Lord, we thank you for your revelation in each of our lives. I speak a blessing over this church. God, that you would cause all of the dreams, the visions, the prophetic words to come true, that they would walk in what you've called them to. Lord, I pray for courage. I pray for courage to push through the resistance or the things in our own mind, our own doubts, our own insecurities, that we would have the courage to do what you're calling us to do, that we would be a courageous people who step out, who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples until we see the entire world praising your name. God, may this be a body, a home, a church, a community that goes the distance, that we see you continuing to move in and through them in this community and around the globe. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. I think Pastor Bill's gonna come and close out the service. I just wanna encourage you guys about what is happening here in the next generation and encourage you to get involved. We have an incredible opportunity uh, for some amazing things coming up here. I'm so excited to get to watch what God is doing. Thanks guys. What a powerful word this morning. Thank you for being obedient to God. These last several weeks, it's just been Sunday after Sunday of God speaking to us. And I believe he's giving such clear direction of what we're to do and how we're to move forward. And uh, so let's lean into it and watch what God's going to do in us and through us in the days and months and years that are ahead. There's great things God wants to accomplish. It'll be a long time before I get out of my mind that picture of the the lions and the crocodile and then when the buffalo stood their ground. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of the lions and the crocodiles. And we're not going to give in our kids. We're not going to let go. We're going to hold on. We're going to watch God do amazing things.